So, uh, interesting, we're marching to Zion, we're talking about who will enter here, right? Uh, we're going to be in Luke chapter 14, uh, verses 15 through 24, um, just kind of been teaching uh, the Wednesday night class out of Luke, and you know, you get ahead and you start reading it, and you think, you know, that would probably be a good uh, sermon, and, and it turns out that when you kind of talk about these things beforehand, the conversation tends to be a little bit better about it as well. Uh, and if you haven't been with us on Wednesday night, then I encourage you to join us as we're studying the Gospel of Luke. Uh, we're in chapter 13 right now. So what we're going to be talking about tonight concerns God's call or His invitation to the kingdom of God uh, to heaven and to those who respond to that call and partake in the feast and those who decline the invitation because of what they have as they feel are more pressing matters that they would like to attend to. And one thing that we want to take away from this really is that we do not want to find ourselves on the wrong side of what the right priorities need to be in our life, when it, especially when it comes to eternal consequences. Uh, and this parable that we're going to talk about, it comes um, as a response to this man's statement about uh, some comments that Jesus made at a dinner that they were both having. And Jesus had just ex ex finished explaining the value of humility and selflessness, and he tells people attending the dinner not to you know, when you go to a dinner, you don't sit in the best seat uh, because you're going to get humiliated and bumped down. But instead, you should sit in the worst seat. And so then you will receive honor and move, be moved up. Um, and he goes on to explain that it is better to invite people to your dinner that cannot pay you back. Because if they pay you back, then you received your reward, right? It's kind of like... Uh, when I used to uh, eat lunch with my partner when I was uh, an investigator, we would switch on and off. The first time, you know, it would be Monday, they would pay, Tuesday, I would pay, and it would go on and on like that. This is when, you know, splitting checks used to be a nightmare, so you would just trade. Now they can split checks for very easily for some reason. I don't know what changed, but it is uh, definitely <laughs> a good thing, I guess. But it's better to, to give to these people that can't pay you back. Uh, and then you receive your reward from God instead of from some person, right? And so he's, he's teaching this, and then some guy just decides to like blurt out, blessed is everyone who eats in the kingdom of God. And, and it's not really clear whether this is like a snarky response or just some person that likes to say obvious things. And have you ever known anybody like that? Uh, some Captain Obvious? <laughs> Sometime, someone, they point out something really uh, obvious or just that the sky is blue, water is wet, it's deep, you know? Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Well, of course, that's true. If you're in the kingdom of God, then obviously you're blessed. So... This Captain Obvious moment uh, becomes the impetus for Jesus to open up about a much more serious and deep conversation on who will be eating in the kingdom of God. Uh, so who is going to actually enter. And he also brings up the possibility of being excluded from that dinner. Um, so what started as this guy making a self-satisfying obvious statement turns into this deep conversation about grace and about mercy, about God and eternal life. So let's, let's take a look at that. It's uh, Luke 14, 15 through 24. He says, Now when one of those who were reclining at the table with him heard this, remember this is Jesus' teaching about inviting the right people or the, the poor and the people that can't pay you back, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he said to him, A man was giving a big dinner, and he invited many. And at the dinner hour, he sent his slave to tell those who had been invited, 
come because everything is ready now. And yet, they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I purchased a field and I need to go out and, and look at it like right now. <laughs> Please consider me excused. And another one said, I bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excused. And another one said, I took a woman as my wife and for that reason, I cannot come. This is the hour of the dinner. Okay, this isn't like, you know, it, it's lame. And the slave came back and reported this to his master. And then the head of the household became angry and said to his slave, go out at once into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in here those who are poor, those with disabilities and those who are blind and those who are limping. And later the slave said, master, what you commanded has been done, and there's still room. And the master said to the slave, Go out into the roads and the hedges and press upon them to come in, so that my house will be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who are invited shall taste my dinner. They're cut off. No. So, we're going to talk about this. So firstly, the man who gives the big dinner, that's God, right? Right? And this is a direct response to what Captain Obvious is talking about. Blessed are those who eat uh, bread in the kingdom of God. This man invites a lot of people. This massive feast. It's a great honor to all these people that are supposed to attend. And they accepted this dinner invitation. They were supposed to go. And he told them when it was ready. It's like saying, I will be at your barbecue. You just tell me when it is. And he does. And they're like, oh, no, never mind. You know, they knew it was coming and they already accepted that invitation and they don't. That's like a breaking of a covenant, right? Yet these folks, one by one, declined, each giving a different reason. And, and what this might be a reference to is the people of Israel, right? The, the Jews. Paul often tells us that Jesus came to the Jew first and then to the Greek later. The Gospels also tell us that he came to his own and his own did not receive him, right? That's John 1.11. So this coincides with also the challenge made by John the Baptist about who truly is uh, an Israelite when he rebuked the, the Pharisees uh, saying in Matthew 3.9, and, and do not assume that you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that God is able from these stones to raise up children of, for Abraham. So these are supposed to be stones transforming into people, I guess. Uh, I don't know if you think that it looks like that or not, but it's kind of questionable. So it's a question about whether these Israelites are guaranteed a spot, even if they reject this invitation that, that Jesus uh, gave them, that Jesus brought them through God, right? God through Jesus. So coming back to our initial passage, though, um, these invited guests decline after accepting for a bunch of different reasons. Purchase a field, purchase some, some uh, yokes of oxen, just got married, you know. And these things represent different things that might take precedence over our relationship with God. The field and the oxen, well, they're fairly obvious, right? They represent wealth and financial opportunity, financial gain, right? The, the, the oxen are a means to make money to plow fields and such. And uh, the, uh, the field is obviously an, uh, an income producing opportunity as well. Uh, you can put more farms, more goods, sell more farm things, you know, products. And the wife represents relationships. And that's something that comes up often in the Bible, actually, is that relationships with certain people sometimes take precedence over people's faith and dedication to God. And that's something that, that Jesus is very much not for that, right? Uh, we know that Jesus is referring to these things too because he rebukes this type of attitude in the next paragraph. So if you keep on reading and you get down to verse 26, he tells you you have to hate your family uh, and yourself in order to come after him. Now, 
hate is not really in the same vein that we would say hate, like not like, you know, I'm going to go commit malicious acts towards this person. It, it means to prefer less, you know, to make, to make following Jesus more important than. So Jesus first, everyone else second. So he talks about that in the next paragraph. So it makes sense that he's alluding to it in this parable, right? <clears throat> um, and in verse 33, he talks about you must give up all of your possessions in order to follow him. So he's saying you have to give up your relationships and your possessions. They cannot be more important than Jesus. You have to be willing to sacrifice everything for God. God gives us a free gift, but in order to accept it, we have to accept it with our whole heart, our whole mind, our whole soul, all that we have. We have to exchange the things of the world for the things of God. We cannot have them both. It is a trade, right? It is a swap. So we give up the things of the world and the priorities of the world in order for the, to have the priorities of God. So Jesus becomes the most important relationship and service to God becomes the most important kind of income for our life. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, not treasures on earth. You see? So we're trading out. You know, when you go and you trade in your car, say you have this old jalopy, it's a piece of garbage, it's junk, it's barely driving, it's like making all these bad noises and it makes you want to cry every time you start it. And that it's miraculous even when it does start, right? And then you finally, you get that onto the car lot and the car dealer, and you have an honest, good car dealer, okay, we'll just pretend. And um, he says to you, you know what? Even trade brand new, you know, BMW or whatever your favorite car is, you know, uh, you, you use your imagination, you know, brand new, nothing wrong with it, runs perfect, no miles on it, it is mint, and I'll give it to you for your piece of garbage over there. You have to be willing to give them the piece of garbage <laughs> for the car. You can't keep both of them. You can't have them both. You have to choose one. That's what the free gift is. It's an exchange. So, that's what, he, that's what he's talking about. And these people are given all these excuses about why they can't uh, do that. The people that don't do that. They're trying to have both. He's saying that these people are trying to have both. So the next part of this parable has to do with inviting people off the street, out in the hedges, <laughs> some guy sleeping under the bushes somewhere, <laughs> the, the poor, the disabled, the outcast, basically everybody that is on the outskirts of society, the ones that, that kind of get pushed to the edges, all the people that typically don't get appreciated. Well, those people are appreciated by God, aren't they? And it doesn't matter where they come from. That's God's point, right? That everybody can be his people now. You know, the gospel is an invitation to everyone not just the, uh, the chosen few like it had been under the previous covenant, right? God made a, a covenant with the nation of Israel and only the children of Abraham could have um, this special relationship with God. Well, that's not the case anymore, right? And th this parable is kind of talking about that, this special relationship that existed between these particular people. Well, they're the ones who are on the outs because they didn't accept the invitation. The people of Israel were no longer favored because they rejected God for their own pursuits and they rejected His Son. It's a reminder that disciples of Christ also can now come from any background. It's a reminder to us as well regarding our responsibility to share the Gospel with all people, with everyone, that we shouldn't get uppity either, right? And Paul says that he... He, he cut out the, the natural uh, cultivated branches and he grafted in the wild ones. Well, me and you are those wild branches unless you are a Jewish person with a heritage that goes all the way back to the time of Jesus and you know it. Uh, outside of that, you're a wild one, <laughs> right? And he says if he cut out the, the, the cultivated ones, he can cut the wild ones out too, right? So... 
we have to be mindful uh, of other people and the way we treat them and not to get the same way that the Jews did, get uppity and reject God's promises and gifts. God wants everyone, from those who are in the street to those living at the corners of a field or under a hedge, He wants to, us to reach them without showing partiality. Not judging people's past. Not judging what walk of life they came from. And that God's grace goes beyond our social status or any earthly blessing that a person might have. And also knowing that we should be diligent not to discriminate against people and to share it with everybody that has a willing ear to listen. I think there is also a warning to us individually in this parable that we have a responsibility to make God our whole life. That we have a responsibility to put Him the focus and the priority of everything that we do. God should come first. He needs to come first if we're going to call ourselves a Christian. If you are a Christian, it means you're one of Christ, right? That the spiritual things of God have to come before the things of the world. That the things of the world cannot supplant the things of God. Jesus comes before everything. Even ourselves and even our own families. God is first. Number one. You know, I, I kind of thought about, well, what would be a good example, in a, maybe in a microcosm, and I thought, you know, there's an encouragement in the Bible to not forsake the assembly, as is the habit of some people. And, and I think that that is a good example because it is an opportunity that all of us have to make worshiping together a priority. A worship is a spiritual enriching experience. It's a time when we commune with God. It is a very special time that we commune with God. And we shouldn't just cast it aside lightly like, you know, I'd rather go to the beach today or go play, go bowling or, you know, do something else. I mean, this, this should be something important to us. Now, of course, there's going to be times when we can't make it and that's a different thing, but we shouldn't treat it lightly, right? And, and sometimes... It's, it gets treated like it's some kind of social club and we have a meeting or something. But this is when we enter the presence of God Himself. He is with us here, right at this very moment. We are with Him in our worship. And that is an amazing thing when you think about it, that God, that we're part of that temple, that Christ, we're part of Christ's body, and that He's looking down on us. You know, all of us should be searching for the greatest blessing and wanting that. We should be looking for the banquet and the invitation because that was the, what was the greater blessing. And those people that cared about their field or their oxen or their um, brand new wife. <laughs> And, you know, it, it's kind of interesting because they knew about this and they didn't get, you know, the oxen in the field like before. You know, they had those things probably. They're just making excuses. Just like a lot of us make excuses about a lot of things that we shouldn't make excuses about. It's serious, right? It's a commitment that we make. And, you know, making a commitment makes us better people, really, in the end, doesn't it? When we stick to something and we do it and we, we work hard for something, it's, it's better, right? It builds us up. It makes us into better people when we can make a commitment to something, especially serving God, especially serving Him, right? Just think about how valuable that is. He wants us to build up our character to, to be better, to be more spiritual people. We're growing together, right? That's what being a Christian, a lot of it is about growing. We start from one place and we can keep growing and growing closer to God, right? It is a journey towards Him. And, and being responsible and, 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 and working and trying to be a better person overall, that's a good goal in life. To be a more spiritual, godly person. That is a wonderful goal for our life. And we should, that should be a number one thing. You know, when we work, we want to, you know, get advancement and get raises and get all this stuff, right? Well, we should have an ambition for Christ. 
a, a desire to be closer to him and have a more intimate and wonderful relationship with him. That should be our number one goal, right? So in conclusion, <laughs> the, the parable teaches us about the inclusivity of God's grace and the urgency of responding to his in, invitation, right? It challenges us to think uh, about our priorities, examine them, ensure that we're not only accepting God's invitation for ourselves and living that invitation in our daily living and our daily lives, but also extending it and offering it to other people with the same generosity and unbiased attitude that, that in which it was offered to us. That's what the parable is all about. All are welcome, all may enter, but they have to have God as their right priority, the most important thing in their life. It's a pretty straightforward thing, but it's really powerful. And it's interesting that it comes after this guy states something so obvious that Jesus uses that to teach us something that's really profound and deep. Well, there we have it. If uh, I want to offer an invitation now, if anybody wishes to come forward for whatever reason, I want to give you the opportunity to do that this evening. If you want to give your life to Jesus, if you haven't done that, if you're out there uh, and you're watching us online, or if you see this uh, at some point, you know, get in contact with us. Our contact information's on our website, so reach out to us, and we can connect you with somebody or connect you with us. And uh, and if you believe in Jesus Christ. You're willing to repent of your sins and be baptized and you can receive the forgiveness of those sins, the gift of the Holy Spirit and eternal life. If that's something that you want to do this evening, I want to encourage you to come on down as we stand and we sing majesty.